Good morning, church. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to find Ephesians chapter 5. Get your spot there, and then I want you to pull out your phone, and I want you to open up your internet browser, whatever that is, if you use Safari or if you have a droid and you annoy everybody in group text because yours is green. Go ahead and pull out your Android phone. And No, just kidding. That's not, I'm just kidding about that. I want you to open up your browser just for a minute, and I want you to go to Google. Just go to google.com, and then in the search bar, I want you to type in the words, happy marriage photo. Just type it in real quick, and then I want you to search And then up at the top, you'll see like all and video. I want you to just go to the images, all right? So type that in, uh, happy family or happy marriage photo, and then search for the images. And I want you to just scroll through for a moment at the photos that will come up on your phone that depict what a happy marriage is supposed to be. And it's likely that you're going to find a picture of a guy who's totally ripped, in a shirt that fits perfectly and probably tailored for him, or you're going to find him and his wife, and they're going to be, <laughs> right? And the sun is going to be perfectly glistening off their face and their hair, and then they might have children who are like skipping through the flowers, and everything just looks perfect, doesn't it? If you want to know that, uh, whether this is being sold to us, go down to Walmart or if you're a high spender, go to Target, right, Whatever you're, wherever you land. And I want you to go, <laughs> go down the aisle where they're selling all the picture frames and just look at all of the stock photos in the back of those picture frames. And you are going to see many of those same images that you find on Google as stock photos for the perfect family picture. That's what it looks like. He's probably like a multimillionaire. They have a yacht. They, all their kids are perfect. Their kids never disobey. When they wake up in the morning, their teeth are already brushed and they don't have morning breath, right? I mean, that's, that's what people have in mind when they think about a happy marriage. Now, we've been in this series about We Are Family, and I have to tell you, as we've been studying over the last month and a half, I've been really looking forward to this one message more than any other. Last week, we, we looked in Ephesians, or two weeks ago, excuse me, we looked in Ephesians chapter 5 at verses 18 to 21, and I just made a couple of points that I want to remind you about. The first thing I said was, be careful what controls you. And remember, he said in verse 18 of Ephesians 5, to be filled with the Spirit, to not be drunk with wine where it is, where it is excess or debauchery, but be filled with God's Spirit. And that verse is ultimately about what controls us, because what controls us affects every area of our lives, the way that we speak, the way that we act, the way that we discipline and raise our children. And then we made the point, and we see that being filled with the Spirit. When we are filled with God's Spirit, there are some things that are going to flow out of our lives. And the first one was worship. And we're going to find thanksgiving in our hearts as well. And then we got down to verse 21 of Ephesians 5, where Paul to the church said, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I made this point that when you are controlled by the Spirit, others become more important than yourself. That within the body of Christ, we should always be submitting to the needs of other people. We should always be serving one another and and looking out for the needs of other people. Now, within a church family, we submit to one another. And in the next few verses, Paul is going to give us some incredibly powerful and profound teaching about the church and about the family. Now, I will tell you this, having been a pastor for a long time and spoken to a lot of couples, I was raised in church, my dad was a pastor, I have often heard this passage misread, misunderstood, and misapplied when it comes to marriage. And what I'm hoping today is to teach you what Ephesians 5 is ultimately about. And then the next few weeks, we're going to look at our roles in our families as husband and wives. Now, if you're single, I don't want you to check out. I don't want you to say, well, I'm I'm single, I'm not married, and so the next few weeks are not going to apply to me. It doesn't matter what your family type is. There's going to be a principle we're going to learn today that will have deep and profound meaning to your life. But these are also truths that you can learn 
to serve other families and other couples who might come to you in time of need. I want us to read the passage, and I want us to just read it in its entirety. But as we read it today, I want you to, in your Bible, or maybe on your notes on your phone, I want you to listen to all of the comparative statements that are found in this passage. Now, to go back to English class, similes and metaphors, right? He was as fast as a gazelle, right? That, that would be a simile, right? Using like or as. You're going to find this comparative reli uh, religion, this comparative language throughout this passage. And every time we come to a phrase where Paul compares what he's talking about with something else, I want you to underline it or highlight it. Because those phrases are going to give us the profound truth I want you to see today. So let's look in Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water, by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that today your word might speak to us the things that we need to hear. Show us the truth of your word and how it impacts our lives and our families. And may our families be a reflection of the glory and the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. Today I want to spend the majority of my time kind of unearthing the truths that we find in verses 29 through 32. And then over the next few weeks, I want us to kind of, with that theme in mind, unpack some more truth for our families. Now in verse 29, we see uh, Christ and the church. And in verse 30, we are referred to as members of the body. Now, You'll recall when we first started this series that I, I pointed out that Paul in Ephesians 3 and verse 21 makes a statement about God's glory in the church. And he said, unto him, unto Jesus, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So the church is the people. You are the body of Christ. And what Paul has been saying, beginning in Ephesians 3.21 and following, is that the way that Christ receives glory is through his people. Unto him be glory in the church, his people throughout all generations. He's been redeeming a people that make up his body. And you'll remember some of the themes that we've studied. That body, these people are to be unified. There's one spirit, one Lord. Remember that, that message. And these people are to be unified yet diverse. We all have a, di a diversity of gifts within the body of Christ. And the people are to be holy and put on the new man and controlled by the Holy Spirit and not redeeming the, uh, or not going after the lust of the flesh. And remember that we, we talked about a couple of weeks ago that God is calling and redeeming to himself a holy people. Unlike those who are without Christ, we are to be noticeably different. Now this language as church and members is used throughout the New Testament. So there'll be some verses that'll come up on the screen, maybe jot these down and look them up later. But Romans 12 and verse 4, Paul wrote, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So the Brook Church 
is a body of Christ. We are multiple members that serve in different functions and in different ways, and yet we are of one body. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So within the church family, you don't lose your individual identity, but your individual identity as a member serves the whole body of Christ, just like your physical body. Your hand is a part of your body, even though it functions in very specific ways. Your leg is another part of your body, and even though it, it separates or functions in a different way than the hand, it still makes up one body. That's the idea that in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 29 and 30, Paul is driving at. You are one body, and yet the church body is made up of individual members. I want us to look at verses 31 and 32 right on the heels of that teaching. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and, they, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, what is Paul talking about there? He's talking about marriage. And he's actually citing Genesis chapter 2. But I want you to notice the language of verse 33. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. I want to study the phrasing of verse 32, just kind of phrase by phrase for a moment. First of all, he begins with verse 32 as this mystery. Do you see it? This mystery is profound. Now the question is, what mystery is Paul referring to? Well, he's referring to the mystery that he has just described in verse 31. And that's a quote of Genesis chapter 2. The mystery to which Paul is referring to is man leaving all others, his father and mother, and holding fast, or as the King James puts it, clinging or cleaving to his wife, and the mystery of two people becoming one flesh or one body. Now, when you go to a wedding ceremony, you have likely seen people do physical things that represent this spiritual reality. For example, old school, we used to use unity candles. They're not used as much anymore, but the mother of the bride and the, and the, or the, the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom would stand together and they would light one candle. And then at some point in the ceremony, the, the bride and groom take those two candles representing their two lives, and they light the one candle in the middle, the unity candle. Therefore, the two flames are what? Becoming one. That represents this mystery of two people becoming one. We use sand ceremonies now, right? They have two jars with sand, one jar in the middle, two different colors, the bride will pour in, the groom will pour in, and those two colors coming together, no longer two, but one. I've also seen it where people actually take rope, two links of rope, and they tie a knot together, symbolizing their two lives becoming one, which is kind of cool, kind of cowboy too, right? I like that. All right? And then, and then there's a new thing now that I've seen over the last few years called a unity cross, and you have a, a cross, that it's, it's something that would sit like on your fireplace mantle. It's an outline of a cross, and then inside of that is, is a very beautiful, ornate kind of decorative uh, material. They put that inside the cross, and then it's held together by three stakes, symbolic of the two people in Christ becoming one. All of those ceremonies that we see in, in weddings represent that mystery of Ephesians 5.31 of two people becoming one. Now, you'll remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10. He said, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When a man and woman come together as husband and wife, two people are becoming one flesh, and God intends for those two to be united for life. This past Wednesday, I did the uh, memorial service for a dear friend of ours that I grew up knowing. They were at, at uh, Belmar Baptist Church when I was pastor there, youth pastor there. And I grew up with her kids and her and her husband had been married 51 years. And when I showed up at the ceremony to do the, the memorial service, it was a beautiful day. And I went up to him and, and, uh, and to, to, the, to the husband and, and just expressed my love and condolences to him. And he said what I have often heard people say when they've been married for any length of time. They say, he said, I feel like a part of me has died. Do you know why people feel that way? It's because of this mystery and that's why he says it's profound. It's not small. When God makes two people one, 
That is a profound miracle of God. And Paul says something interesting in verse 32, and I don't want you to miss it. He says, this mystery refers to Christ and the church. Do you see it? This mystery of two becoming one is profound. And then he says, but it, that mystery, refers to Christ and his church. Now, I want you to hold your spot in Ephesians 5 and turn to Genesis chapter 2 for just a moment. In Genesis chapter 2, we find the creation of man, and we find God bringing man and woman together as husband and wife for the first time. So in Genesis 2, 7, the Bible tells us that the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. And you remember the rest of the story. God made a garden. He placed Adam in that garden. And then God began to bring all the animals to Adam to name and Adam began to name all of the animals, but then we find the biblical account was there was not a helper that was suitable for him. And so I want you to pick up the story uh, in Genesis chapter 2. And Paul, excuse me, when, when God put Adam to sleep, remember God took a rib from Adam and he formed the woman. And then God brought the woman to the man. So after the animal kingdom was not satisfactory, sorry for all of you that think your pets are part of the family. My bad. So when none of that could satisfy, he made woman and brought the woman to Adam. And then notice what Adam said in verse 23 of Genesis 2. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, in your Bible, as you're holding Genesis chapter 2, you will notice that to the left of where you're holding is very thin and to the right is very thick. We are two chapters into the Bible, just moments into the history of man, and we have man and woman created and brought together the first wedding vows ever recorded. But I want you to see this, that in Genesis chapter 2, the church did not exist. And in Genesis chapter 2, Christ, Jesus, had not yet come. So I want you to turn back for a moment to Ephesians chapter 5 again. So Jesus isn't there in Genesis 2, and the church does not exist in Genesis chapter 2, and yet, in verse 32 of Ephesians 5, Paul says, this mystery exists. A man leaving father and mother clinging to his wife and the two becoming one flesh. And Paul says this, in Genesis 2, 24, you have misunderstood what happened there if you do not understand that that mystery is a reference to Christ and his church. So the real question then is, well, what in the world does that mean? How can Genesis 2, 24 be referring to Christ and the church and the church was not in existence then and Jesus Christ had not yet come. I want to remind you today, I want to try to answer that question. I want to remind you of a few truths from, from, some, from some passages, and I want you to write all these down and look them up later. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul wrote that Jesus has saved us, that God has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus, and I want you to underline this phrase, before the ages began. Now this is a, a verse that describes our salvation in Christ. And Paul says he saved us, he called us to a holy calling, not because of any good works that we had done, but his grace and for his purpose. In other words, he was going to get a people by grace in Jesus Christ. And look at verse uh, 9 up on the screen. When did he give us that? He gave it to us, past tense, not at the moment you place your faith in Christ. What does it say? Before the world was ever formed. Before Genesis chapter 2, 24, when man leaves father and mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh, before the world was ever created, God saved us, he called us, he chose us by his grace. 
He gave us the gift of salvation in Christ before the foundation of the world. So before the world ever existed, before Adam and Eve existed, God redeemed to himself a holy people. And that, my friends, is good news. Before sin entered the world, there was already a gospel of God's grace. Now, I want to remind you again in Ephesians chapter 1 of some incredible truths there. Look back a few pages in Ephesians 1 and verse 4. Even as he chose us in him, here's the language again, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love and dot, dot, dot there for a moment. Notice the truths in that verse. He chose us. He made a way for us to be redeemed. He was calling to himself a holy people when? Before the foundation of the world. Before Genesis 2-7, when God breathed into man the breath of life. Before Genesis 2-24, when man and woman were brought together, he chose us before the foundation of the world. And notice at the end of verse 4, it's in love. John 3-16 records these powerful and beautiful words. For God so loved the world, mankind, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now look at verse 5 of Ephesians 1. In love, at the end of verse 4, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So many theologians and pastors and Christians have argued through the years about predestination. And they want to argue and get themselves in camps. Listen, there's not one person that's going to heaven that God's going to say, man, I'm surprised you're here. Didn't see that one coming. He chose us and he predestined us for, for salvation before the beginning of the world. That's what it says. But I want you to notice verse 5 that he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Do you hear the family language there? And I relate so strongly to this word. That word predestined, is, it means to predetermine. And he says he predetermined us for adoption into his family. If you're a child of God, a child of the king, know that it's not because of what you done, it, you have done. It's all because of what God has done for you. He chose you before the foundation of the world. In 2015, my family and I predetermined to travel to China to adopt a little girl into our family. We did all of the necessary work to make that happen. And we chose her, and we paid the price of what it would cost to bring her in legally into our family. And we made the trip, and then they brought her there. And from that moment on, Ellie was a part of the Pollard family. We brought her in as a daughter into our family. And I've said before, she is an heir to all of the riches of the Pollard family. A 2013 Suburban that's falling apart. A minivan with door handles that were falling off years ago. She has the life, right? But I want you to see the reality that it's the same with Christ. Before you breathe your first breath on the earth, before any man did, God chose you. And he paid the price for you. He made a way for you to be brought into his family as a son and as a daughter of God. Not because of who you are, but because of his glorious love and grace. And I love the phrasing of Ephesians 1.6. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That's a, that's a family title. He's brought us into the family of the beloved. But I love the phrasing of not to the praise of his grace, to the praise of his glorious grace. That word glorious there is doxa in the Greek. We get our English word doxology, and it means praise. It means glory and honor. You see, the gospel speaks of God's love. The gospel speaks of grace. And the gospel is God bringing us into his family because of his great love, through his glorious grace, by his choice. We are children of God. And that brings us to Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. When Christ came into the world and died for his bride to bring her to himself, you heard the language, as a pure and blameless people. 
I want you to hear this. God didn't say, I want to think of an analogy that will help people understand the gospel. And so I'll use marriage. Marriage is not something that God used or needed to clarify the coming of Jesus. God in this passage is not saying to us, if you understand marriage, you can understand the gospel. One of the most profound misreadings of this text is that people will say this, marriage gives meaning to the gospel. And so they will read that passage and they will say, marriage gives meaning to the gospel. If you understand marriage, you can understand the gospel. If you understand the love of a husband, then you can understand the love of Christ. If you understand the grace that's needed in marriage, then you'll understand the grace that's, that's found in Christ. If you understand the order of the home, that the husband is the head of the wife and, and the family, then you'll understand the head of, of a, the gospel in the church is Jesus. But if you believe that this passage is teaching this or you're reading it through that lens, you will arrive at a lot of wrong conclusions. This is what the passage teaches. The gospel gives meaning to marriage. That's what I've wanted to share with you for over a month and a half now. The gospel gives meaning to marriage. That's why when I read this passage, I told you to listen for all of the as Christ statements. Did you hear them? They're throughout this passage. So we find in Ephesians 5 and verse 23, what for some is a difficult uh, and very challenging verse. But it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ, there's the language, is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. We skip over that last phrase of verse 23, don't we? I mean, Christ is the head of the church, and then some people would say in our culture, well, how can we say that the husband is the head of the wife? That's an outdated idea. Well, everybody's equal, and the answer to that is absolutely. My wife and I in our marriage are absolutely equal in the eyes of God, but God gives me a responsibility to lead my family. It's not something that I chose. It's not something that I wanted, but it is something that God places in my lap as a husband to be the head of my home and to lead my family. And I'm telling you today that if you will understand Jesus and the gospel, you will understand marriage. Because the last phrase of verse 23 is what? Jesus is the head of the church, but he is also the savior of the church. I want you to think about that for a moment. Why is Jesus the savior of the church? Let me give you the scripture. Acts 20 and verse 28, he purchased the church with his own blood. Ephesians 5 and verse 2, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Colossians 1.20 he made peace for us with God by the blood of his cross. John 10 and verse 11, I'm the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, but Christ emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You see, the gospel gives meaning to marriage. The gospel defines marriage. Before marriage was ever instituted in Genesis chapter 2, before Adam and Eve were brought together as husband and wife, the glorious, gracious gospel of our loving God already existed. So if you can understand the gospel, you can understand what godly marriage looks like. Jesus is the Savior of the body. And as the Savior... He purchased the church with his blood. As Savior, he gave himself for the good of the church. As Savior, he humbled himself to the point of death so that others may live. And because he is head and he is a trustworthy Savior, verse 24 of Ephesians 5, the church joyfully lets Christ lead us, does it not? 
because he is a trustworthy head of the church and he's the savior of the body, the church has no problem or should not have a problem submitting itself to the lordship and the headship of Christ because he was willing to lay his life down for us. And we're going to unpack this next week for all the men. But submission flows when you have a trustworthy leader in the family. The gospel gives meaning to marriage. That's why Paul continues in verse 25 and he says, Husbands, love your wives. Here's the comparison language again. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I often say this, that the next couple that comes to me and says, Look, it's not working out because my husband just loves me too much. They will be the first. It's true. And every husband I've ever done a wedding ceremony knows if I want to be a good leader in my home, I have to give myself always for the good of my wife. I have to die to self like Christ on the cross for the good of my wife. But knowing it and doing it are two very different things. It doesn't say husbands say you love your wife. It says husbands actively love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus didn't just tell us he loved us. He loved us, and then he went to the cross for us. It was an act of love. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous in place of the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. He died and then made alive by the Spirit. 1 John three sixteen. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. John 15, 13, Jesus himself said, you will not find a greater love than this than a man lay his life down for his friends. 1 Peter 2, 24, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. Not his sins, your sins and mine. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds, you have been healed. Husbands in the room, I want you to hear this. If you want to know what it means to love your wife, I want you to, in your heart and in your mind, crawl up to that bloody cross and look up and see Jesus dying not for his wrong, but for yours and giving himself for your good and see the love and the grace of Jesus Christ and you see the example of how you are to love your wife. Husbands, love your wives in the same way that Jesus loved us on the cross. And then in your heart and in your mind and with your will, you crawl up on that cross and you die to yourself for the good of your wife and for the good of your family. That's the language. You see, the gospel gives meaning to our marriage. The gospel defines our marriage. Wives, do you want to know how to submit to your husband and to support him as the leader of your family? You do the same thing. You crawl up to that same cross and you see Jesus willfully giving himself for the good of someone else. And then you crawl up on that cross in your own heart and in your own mind and with your will and you crucify yourself for the good of someone else. That's how marriage is defined, not the other way around. Marriage does not define the gospel. gospel the gospel doesn't need an analogy. The gospel is the analogy. Jesus on the cross is the example and the definition of what marriage is. So husbands, love your wives like Christ loved you. And notice in verse 26, love with a purifying love. And then in verse 28, with the same regard that you have for your well-being. And then in verse 29, with a love that nourishes and cherishes, a love that is a mother taking care of a child. Husbands, love your wives in that same way. The gospel gives meaning to marriage. You see, in the gospel, we are taught how to love. I'm going to ask you to come on. Mitchell. The gospel teaches us how to love. The gospel teaches us how to give. The gospel teaches us how to live. The gospel teaches us how to be pure. The gospel teaches us how to grow. The gospel will teach you how to be a good husband. The gospel will teach you how to be a good wife. And we'll see in a few weeks, the gospel will help you and show you what it means to be good, godly parents. I shared a few weeks ago, I actually in August, that that one of the greatest compliments that I've received at the brook is not the color of my shirts, and I thank you for those. The greatest compliment was when someone told me, you preach the gospel a lot. And my response to that was, thank you. Because the gospel defines everything that we are as believers in Christ. 
And this is why we preach the gospel. Because the mystery of marriage is profound. And the gospel defines or gives meaning to our marriages. And so that's why we preach the gospel. I need to hear the gospel preached to me so that I can be a better husband. I need the gospel preached to me so I can be a better dad. I need the gospel preached to me because I need to be a better friend. I need the gospel preached to me because I need to be a better pastor. We need the gospel. You see, the gospel, yes, it saves us for eternity, but the gospel transforms us not to be a better version of you, not so that you can be a better husband. The gospel transforms you so that you can be more like Jesus. The gospel transforms you and will help you love your wife when she is unlovable. And the gospel will help you love your husband when he is unlovable. The gospel will help you to forgive. The gospel shows you how to live. The gospel shows you how to love. The gospel shows you how to surrender your will to the needs of other people. So if Jesus were to paint a picture of marriage, it wouldn't be all those stock photos that you looked up earlier. You want to know a picture of, the, of marriage? Look to the cross. And look to Jesus there as your example. And then in your heart say to him, Lord, make me more like you. Would that be your prayer today with mine? Will you join me in praying that for you and your family? Let's stand today with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we, we come to you today in the name of our precious Jesus and, and feeling such a burden for families and marriages, seeing where Satan attacks so frequently and just thinking through the stories in our church, thinking of the story of my life. It's obvious, Lord, that there are areas of our lives where we just need to surrender to the gospel to make us more like Jesus. For every husband in the room today, I pray that he would be more like Jesus. That he would stop trying to read books and do all the, the things that someone might share with him, but he would simply look to Jesus on the cross and pray in his heart, Lord, make me more like you. For every wife that's struggling today, I pray that today our prayer, her prayer would be, Lord, make me more like Jesus. For every young person who might be considering marriage one day, that even now in their youth, even now in their single state, that they would be praying the same thing, Lord, make me more like you. For every widow, widower, every person who's single, every teenager, every child, every man and woman in this room today, our prayer today is make us more like Jesus. We thank you for your glorious and wonderful grace. We thank you for all that we have in Jesus. May you be glorified and magnified in our lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.